So good afternoon to everybody or good morning if you are in the US, for instance. So please uh, mute your microphone if you didn't uh, already. And welcome to the second day of the AGN tournay 2021. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to chair and to present this session. Uh, the speakers today are uh, uh, Francesca Civano and Fabio Vito, both uh, uh, graduated in Bologna and both are good old friends and, uh, and colleagues. So Francesca, uh, after graduation, moved uh, uh, to the US. She worked at the CFA, at Yale, at Dartmouth, and now she is back uh, to the CFA with the uh, permanent staff position at the Chandra x Center where she's working as a deputy manager for data processing. Uh, Fabio, um, after graduation, also moved overseas, uh, first to the US, then to Chile, and then back again to Italy, uh, to the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, where he's holding a position as a postdoctoral researcher uh, up to now. Uh, so um, the topic uh, today uh, we talk about uh, is uh, um, uh, new facilities to track down obscured AGN, how many are we missing and what is hiding them. Both Fabio and Francesca are uh, uh, very expert on uh, deep X-ray service. I think X-rays will play a role in, in their talks. And uh, I think, uh, especially in the light of uh, the, uh, the CADA report that came out yesterday, maybe uh, there will be also some comment about uh, uh, the prospects for new X-ray facilities and the future of X-ray astronomy uh, in general. So Fabio will start first, then Francesca, and then we will have a uh, 20 minutes uh, discussion or so. So please, Fabio, welcome, and uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Let me share the screen. Uh, I think it's this one. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, full screen now? Okay. So um, let me thank the organizers for inviting me today to talk about this topic. So if the black holes, how many we are missing and what kind of facilities we can use to track them down. Um, I want to start with, oh, I cannot actually. Okay. Okay, I want to start with this caveat that I'm not going to be completely exhaustive in my discussion. And for this reason, I'm actually going to uh, immediately restrict the field of the discussion to high redshift accretion um, and the course, so AGNs and quasars, so the redshifts. So high redshift, I mean, the uh, course in the first giga year of the universe, so about redshift six or higher. Even though I'm going also to refer to some results as like low ratio, so ratio about four or so. Or so. Um, okay, so I'm going to present this discussion as a, a, a tournament between two approaches. Uh, one approach is going deep, one approach is going wide. Going deep means um, using deep surveys that uh, have uh, complete multi wavelength coverage down to very uh, very deep uh, flux limits, but they cover only small fields on, on the sky. Uh, Green wide means using white field surveys that cover white fields on the sky, thousands of square degrees, but down to some shallow um, flux limit. So why are we interested in two high redshift uh, missing uh, AGM? Well, this is in the context of the formation and early growth of supermassive black holes. We still don't know how black holes are formed in the first place. Uh, there is a lot of theoretical work going on. Several models try to understand how the cause form and try to describe the, the population of the cause we see from the, from high ratio down to the local universe. However, we have only have very few observational constraints, and most of them come from the detection of very luminous quasars, so actually six and, and seven. But these quasars actually represent just the tip of the overall population of the cause. Most of the black holes are actually missed, most of the accreting black holes are missed, and, but they will provide the best observational constraints to models of the core formation. So what kind of VGNs at high ratio do we know? We know hundreds of um, quasars, are actually six and higher. Um, the vast majority of them have been selected you know, through uh, color uh, techniques in the wide field optical infrared service like SDSS, pan stars, and so on, basically exploiting a very strong feature in the spectra of high quasar, the fact that at wavelength shorter than the laminal emission line, 
the entire flux of the quasar is actually suppressed by neutral hydrogen uh, absorption. So basically the Lyman alpha forest and the Lyman break. <clears throat> so if we plot the known samples of directional quasars, this color point in this luminosity versus the cold mass plane, we see that um, quasars at high ratio, known quasars at high ratio, populate the upper uh, boundary of the overall distribution of uh, optically selected quasars at all um, cosmic times, this gray uh, area. So, what kind of high ratio PGNs do we know? Uh, we know only optically classified type 1 quasars. They have very high luminosities. This is by selection because we're using these quite few surveys which have kind of shallow flux limit, magnitude limit, so we can select only the most luminous uh, quasars. And apparently, all of them are powered by very massive, supermassive black holes, so already involved black holes. So then, what kind of AGNs are we missing? Well, we're missing those that have not these properties. We are missing uh, AGNs that are not classified as type 1 quasars, so type 2 quasars, obscure quasars, and so on. We're missing low luminosity AGNs and those that are powered by low mass black holes. I'm not going to talk about this in particular because I think they will be covered by another talk in this series of talks. So let's start with type 2 AGNs. Um, we think they're very important because they represent the early phases of extremely fast and inefficient supermassive black hole growth. So material grow onto the uh, black hole seeds, the seed grows and reaches the masses of the luminous squares as we see uh, at a redshift. So for instance, in this work led by Fabio Di Mascia in Pisa here like last year, we used numerical uh, cosmological simulations. So this is, for instance, a structure, a few tens of kiloparsec wide. This is a snapshot of ratio 6.3. In this structure, we have four accreting supermassive black holes, four AGNs, luminous AGNs actually. But when we consider also the dust along the line of sight, so extinction by the dust, and we produce the UV emission map, we see that only black hole A is visible, it's a bright source. So if we have this structure in one of these white field optical near infrared so, uh, surveys, we would detect only quasar A, and we would know nothing about the existence of other black holes just a few kiloparsecs away from this UV selected AGN. However, these other black holes, accreting black holes, are hosted by um, dust star forming galaxies, so that they would appear as bright infrared sources. On, short, on small scales or small distances from the optical selected quasar. And actually, this, and actually uh, a large fraction of energy quasars present um, companion galaxies detected with ALMA. So these are just three examples. This is the uh, C flux map. Here we have the uh, quasar host. This is the companion galaxies, a few kiloparsecs away. Same here, this is the quasar. This is a companion galaxy. In this case here, the companion galaxy is actually stretched because it's merging with the host of the, of the quasar. So these kind of objects, which are not detected in the rest frame UV or are very, very faint in the rest frame UV, can actually host, uh, for instance, obscure the GNs. How can we know? For instance, we can use X-ray observations because X-ray observations are much less affected by obscuration than, for instance, optical bands. So if we see X-ray emission coming from one of these galaxies, we are pretty sure it is an accreting AGN, so an obscure AGN. And actually, all of these examples of companion galaxies around um, high ratio quasars have been covered with uh, relatively deep gender observations, and none of them have been detected significantly in the X ray band. So today, we don't know any obscure AGNs at high ratio, especially uh, among these kind of companion galaxies of high ratio quasars. None of them have been selected with high significance in the X-rays. So the best example, the best, best candidates we have for being type 2 AGNs at high redshift come from the ShellQ survey. ShellQ is one of these white field surveys. It's, it covers about uh, 1,400 square degrees. It goes slightly deeper than other similar surveys. So can, they can actually select about 18 narrow line AGN candidates at high redshift 6. This is uh, the, an example of one of these objects. This is the, the restrain UV spectrum. However, we are not sure that these kind of objects are really um, type 2 AGNs. They can also be, for instance, bright line and emitters, so bright galaxies, for instance. What we want to do to confirm the AGN nature is to do follow up observations. 
This is what has been done in this work. They did deep spectroscopy on this object here. They could uh, detect the carbon-4 emission line doublet, but they could not detect any other higher ionization emission lines, such as the nitrogen type, even two, and so on. So we still don't know if these kind of objects are really type two quasars or not. What we really want to have, uh, we would like to have, is um, deep X-ray observations again, because again, if we get an, an X-ray detection from one of these objects, it is an obscure GF. Yeah. So what kind of problems we have with wifey surveys relative to the detection and selection of type two agents at redshift? They have shallow flux limits. They can select on rare and luminous objects, which are typical in type one quasars. And then they also require deep follow-up observations, especially in X-ray band, to confirm uh, the candidates. So to confirm that one type two agent candidate is actually uh, an AGM. So what about deep surveys, in particular X-ray surveys? Again, X-ray selection is much more efficient in detecting obscure agents, especially at high redshift. So here we use the deepest X-ray service we have today, the chamber with fields, and we could constrain the um, obscure AGM fraction at all luminosities, basically, for AGMs a ratio between three and six, let's say a ratio four. So the, this obscure AGM fraction is very, very high. 70 to 80% of AGMs are actually four. X-ray selected AGMs are actually heavily obscure. If we compare this, this, this fraction with um, results in the local universe, this gray points here, we see that there is a, a strong and positive evolution of this obscure gen fraction from the local universe up to ratio four. If this evolution continues up to ratio six, this means that we will be missing many, many uh, AGNs ratio six simply because they are obscure, so extinct basically. However, uh, this service covers small areas in the sky so that we can collect just small samples. We have uh, statistical problems basically. Another big problem is the spectroscopic identification of the X-ray selected AGN candidates. So these objects are obscure AGNs, typically low luminosity AGNs. They are very faint in optical bands. It's very difficult to get a spectroscopic redshift for these sources. And finally, um, another big problem is that I think we have reached the, um, the, the capabilities of current facilities. We want to have X-ray surveys deeper than what we already have now with current facilities. We will need new facilities, new uh, X-ray observatories. So let's move to low luminosity AGMs. Um, they're important because if we move to low luminosities, we are moving to low masses. So we are kind of approaching the initial masses, initial conditions of black hole formations. So low luminosity AGMs would provide the best observation of instrument models of black hole formation. Again, the best examples of low luminosity AGS that I actually we have today come from the Shaipu survey. So these this blue points are low luminosity AGS left in, in the survey. So you can see that they push uh, a couple of magnitude deeper the selection of uh, ratio six quasars. So what did they can do, for instance, is to derive the UV luminosity function of quasars, this uh, orange points here. Uh, the uh, UV luminosity function of quasars, and they could extend the, um, the luminosity function down to luminosities below the break of the luminosity function. However, when you also consider galaxies, so these red points here are the UV luminosity function of galaxies are actually six. At some point, you reach a, a, a magnitude in which the galaxies start to dominate over the gem. If you go deep enough, you will have much more. Uh, many more galaxies than a GM, it would be very difficult to understand if an object is a low luminosity GM and not, for instance, a bright galaxy. And actually, we already reached this kind of uh, range of magnitude where the two populations uh, started to mix. So, the problems with wet surveys related with the detection of low luminosity GMs is that they, they're wide, so they have shallow flux limits, they need to go deeper than what uh, they did. A, a list uh, for what many uh, surveys are, are, are concerned. Actually, a few surveys can go deeper, but they kind of reach this, uh, this magnitude range where galaxies start to dominate over the GM population. And so we need, for instance, uh, follow up observations to confirm that an object is a low luminosity GM and not uh, a bright galaxy. Again, in deep X ray surveys, we can actually select um, AGMs with much lower luminosities. And this is, for instance, the evolution of the X-ray selected AGM number density, so the number of AGMs 
as a function of redshift for different um, beams of luminosity. So high luminosity GNs in green and black points here, and low luminosity GNs in, in uh, yellow and purple uh, in this figure. So what we see here is the number of the GNs, and especially low luminosity GNs, decreases quite strongly if we approach redshift six. This is a problem because again, uh, deep surface means small areas. Uh, so we are um, missing rare objects. And if the number of the GNs is becoming lower, going at higher redshift, these objects are becoming rarer. So we are starting to miss them. We, we can collect just very, very small samples of high redshift, even low luminosity, uh, high redshift GNs. And the problems are, again, the spectroscopic identification of these candidates and the fact that we have reached the capabilities of current X-ray facilities. So now that we know what kind of AGNs we are missing, we can try to estimate how many are there and we don't see. So we can use, for instance, the following, uh, the following comparison. We can start from the uh, UV luminosity function of quasars, so actually to six, which by construction includes only type one quasar, so unobscured objects. We would like to compare this, for instance, with the X-ray luminosity function, which is much more complete because it includes also um, obscured, heavily obscured, the GNs, and so on. However, we don't have the X-ray luminosity function of the GNs of actually for six. We have it direction of four. So what we can do is to extrapolate it for actually four to actually six. And if we do this, we get this, um, this result. You see here, there is a kind of significant discrepancy, which suggests that we are missing uh, about 90% or even more of, of, of AGNs are actually six at all luminosities simply because they are obscured. So they're extincted, we don't see them in rest frame UV and we miss them. This fraction is actually compatible with this um, evolution we saw of the obscure gene fraction from the, the local universe up to ratio four. If this evolution continues, we can reach this kind of, this kind of fraction. What about low luminosity GNs? Well, we are missing basically all of them. Uh, we just started to scratch the surface of um, low luminosity GNs are actually the six, but then we have, there is also this additional problem uh, related to galaxies. So this dashed line here is the luminosity function, the UV luminosity function of galaxies are actually six. And we see that already at the flux limits, at the magnitude limits uh, where um, shell Q uh, rise, galaxies dominate by a factor of basically 100. Okay, so this is kind of the tournament, the turning between these two approaches, going deep and going wide. Here I summarized all the pros and the cons of the two approaches I already discussed. I would like to point out that actually this is what we really want to do. We want to go deep, we want to reach high completeness in selecting low luminosity GNs, obscure GNs up to very high redshift, which means um, in this case, probably using uh, deep surveys. So at this stage, I think this, uh, this fighter is winning the, the tournament. However, we also have to consider um, the facilities. So what kind of facilities we have? Can we use these facilities to, to go deeper or, or just to go wide? So what I'm going to do now is to try to divide some current and future facilities in, into teams, let's say. One team supporting the going deep approach, one team supporting the going wide approach. It is an arbitrary division. It is based on field of view, the angular resolution, the sensitivity of, this, of these facilities. And also, I noticed that uh, some people actually are present both on the left and the right side of this audience, which is a bit weird. Um, but actually, this is what happens also for facilities. Uh, the, same, the same observatory can actually be used to do both. For instance, JWST will be extremely efficient, extremely important to do very deep extragalactic surveys, but it can also be extremely useful to fo for following up um, objects selected in wide field surveys. So, for instance, JWST can play for both teams, but still I'm going to uh, divide all facilities into, into groups. This is what I have in mind. So this is the, the team deep. Um, for the optical infrared bands, we have HST, JWST, of course, in the future we will have VLT and TMT. Uh, Alma will, is very useful to study, for instance, the, uh, the host galaxies of these um, AGNs. What about the X-rays in particular? Well, Chandra for sure um, plays for this team. Chandra uh, uh, performed the deepest X-ray service we have today. And uh, in principle, in the future, we will also have uh, other missions like Lynx and Axis. They are kind of super Chandra for what service are concerned. They can do, they can, they can reach much deeper sensitivity limits. 
uh, over also slightly uh, wider areas. What about um, the team wide? So we have many ground based wide field optical infrared telescopes. Uh, in the future, we will have Rubin. Rubin will cover half of the sky every few days down to some kind of deep uh, magnitude limit. We will have Euclid and, and in the future, we will have also Rho. At longer wavelengths, we already have LOFAR, we will have SKA. And in particular for the X ray, I actually put, it, uh, put here both XMM and Athena, not because they cannot do deep surface, but because they, um, they cannot go deeper than Chandra, but they can go wider than Chandra. So uh, I think they play better for, for this team, and in particular for this, they can follow up objects selected in, in wide field surveys. And of course, Erosita is already covering all of the sky down to some uh, shallow flux limit, but it would be very useful to detect rare and luminous objects. For instance, if you have an intrinsically luminous AGNs, it is not visible or it is very faint in optical infrared bands, but it is very bright at source source. Erosita will see it. Okay, so however, links and axes are uh, have been proposed, our, our mission concepts have been proposed to the 2020 MESA to survey. And incidentally, yesterday, uh, the results of the surveys have been published. Uh, I don't know if Francesca wants to comment on this. She's a much more uh, suitable person than me to talk about this. I would just say a couple of words regarding X ray uh, missions and at least what I understand from this, uh, from this document. What, what are the prospects for our links like missions? As far as I understand, uh, we won't have it, any kind of links like mission, not for sure, not before the mid 40s, something like that. What about an axis like mission? This is maybe more optimistic. Possibly we can have it in, in the 30s, but uh, there would be um, a, a competition between a far infrared mission and x ray mission. But again, maybe Francesca wants to comment more on this. In my opinion, the prospects are not extremely bright and not extremely optimistic. So Given all these uncertainties and this time, very long time scales, I'm going to remove links and axes from this list. So now we see there is an imbalance. We have many more facilities than playing for this team, especially X-ray facilities than for the uh, team deep. So here I have that um, this line for the pros is supporting the going wide approach. Uh, we will have many more facilities, including X-rays. Um, so my personal outcome of this, of this uh, tournament is that this fighter is the more winner because this is what we really want to do. We want to go deep, reach high complete completeness in selecting low luminosity, obscure GNs up to very high redshift. But actually, this is the actual winner simply because we will have many more facilities, including X ray facilities in the future. And of course, ideally, we would like to, uh, to do both. We would like to do both approaches because they are highly complementary. And I think I'm stopping here. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Really perfect timing, and there's plenty of things to discuss. So let's postpone the whole discussion after Francesca's speech. So please, Francesca, if you're ready, you can go on. OK, do you guys see my screen? Yes. What about now? Yes. Is the good see. view? Yeah. Okay. Not the presenter view, right? It is the presenter view, yes. It is the presenter view? No, it is the, you know. The big screen one. The big screen okay. View, yes. okay. Okay. That's, that's what I wanted. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Paolo, for inviting me uh, to give this talk in the AGM tourneys. And thank you, Fabio, uh, for the um, very good talk on the high Z um, AGM uh, um, perspective. Um, so um, I will give my complete, uh, my personal, incomplete, totally biased view of this subject uh, on uh, new facility to tap um, hidden black holes, how many are we missing and what hide them. And uh, first of all, to understand how many are we missing, we uh, want to start like what we know so far about the um, AGM. And uh, I will start with, of course, my classic uh, sensitivity survey plot and uh, of course I, would have, I need to show this and this is like um, a classic survey plot representing uh, the last 20 years of Chan and XMM Newton uh, surveys. Um, of course uh, I'm sure you're saying oh my survey is missing from there and yes probably it is 
There is also a newer version of this plot in Marchesi, uh, most re uh, recent paper. And uh, uh, what I want to show is that uh, Chan and XMM have uh, um, uh, uh, completed all these surveys in the past 20 years, covering both very small areas of very deep fluxes, like the Chan AP South, 7 million seconds, but also covering larger areas, which of course in turn uh, don't reach those very deep fluxes, but are, are rather shallow. And of course, this all depends from uh, how much um, uh, telescope time your survey um, is uh, granted or is allowed uh, to uh, observe your favorite area of the sky. But uh, uh, together, uh, all these surveys have like um, uh, uh, assembled a very nice sample of AGN. And here, like uh, I'm showing uh, um, a compilation of, of the AGN that has been detected in some of these surveys, not all of them. And I need to give credit to my uh, postdoc, Shuri Zhao, that put together this figure for me. And we have now tens of thousands, many tens of thousands of uh, AGN spanning uh, uh, in the X ray, almost like six decks or more uh, in X ray flux. And, uh, a very broad range of redshift um, going even to very high redshift of uh, not so many. And with these sources, uh, uh, we have been able to study the AGN population and its properties, the AGN demographics. And uh, so what do we know about these sources? And I'm gonna just touch a very few points and it's gonna be very incomplete. Uh, first of all, we uh, uh, use all the sources uh, to build the luminosity function. So how the source is evolved in luminosity and redshift. And uh, this is like one example, a compilation for, uh, from James Aird a few years ago. And what we see is that uh, uh, sources, uh, 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 all the sources that we have uh, allow us to track the luminosity uh, function from uh, low redshift to very high redshift, both the high and low luminosities. But when we start to get to very high redshift, as the Fabio just mentioned, uh, samples become uh, small and uh, mainly we can see the sources that, that are the most luminous. And so the high uh, hand of the luminosity function is the one that is uh, suffering the most because we have a uh, very small and uh, bias towards high luminosity uh, samples. So we are missing those AGN, um, um, uh, high redshift AGN sources that uh, Fabio just talked about. What about the obscuration and the spectral properties of these sources? Thanks to both Chandra and also XMM, we were able to perform very good spectral analysis and derive the spectral properties of the AGN in this sample. And here are just two examples, one from the Chandra the Cosmos Service from Marchese et al. And the other one from the XMM Chandra EP South by Ivasawa et al, 2020. And uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, excellent spectra, we can measure the obscuration of the sources and uh, um, derive the obscured fraction and the evolution of the obscured fraction. And this is from Liu et al in the Chandra de Sao, but see also other work like Zappa Costa uh, in the new star, um, using new star data. And so we uh, uh, were able to constrain the obscure fraction up to a decent redshift uh, uh, three uh, and higher, as uh, Fabio just showed for the higher redshift sources with the larger uncertainties. But uh, while this is like, um, uh, I would say, roughly well constrained, uh, you get in trouble when you look at the Compton Tick uh, AGN, which are the most obscured. And if we look at the Compton Tick fraction, and this is a work by Giorgio Lanzuizi in the Cosmos field, you see that um, uh, at a redshift greater than zero, with the, the Compton Tick AGN selected in surveys, we start to have um, larger error bars because the sample are small and the spectra are not so well uh, um, uh, defined. And so it's harder to get uh, uh, the true uh, Compton Tick uh, fraction and therefore compare with the say population synthesis models. The other thing that we were able to do for our AGN is to study the host properties thanks to the multi wavelength data available for all of the AGN in these uh, X ray surveys. And I'm showing just a few examples from a few years back. We were able to study the uh, um, morphology of the host galaxies of, AG, of AGN, and we see that the AGN preferentially don't uh, like to live in one or the other type of galaxy. 
star formation rate and uh, uh, X-ray activity seems to track each other uh, for most of the sources. And uh, when we can get the black hole mass for uh, our AGN, and is of course uh, uh, mainly biased towards type one AGN because measuring the black hole mass directly for obscured AGN is harder. I'm not gonna go into details about that. We can uh, uh, build scaling relation for the AGN in our surveys. And, what, and uh, in general, we don't find a lot of evolution uh, with redshift, but what comes to um, our eye immediately is that we are missing the low mass black holes. We don't detect that many in the, in the X-ray. And uh, so definitely um, uh, samples of those type of sources are really uh, rare. And the other thing I wanted to mention is variability and, and time domain studies. And this is like a um, kind of like a, a very interesting uh, property of AGN, but of course uh, it's not very easy to start variability because you need to uh, accumulate a lot, of, a lot of data for AGN there and uh, beyond the sources in the local universe, there isn't uh, so much work that has been done um, at a high redshift. Of course, the channel is result with 7 million seconds of integration and uh, 17 years of data is the best place uh, uh, to study AGN variability. And there is a lot of work that has been done by Maurizio Paulillo and, Hollis and his collaborators about this subject. And these are a few examples of light curves uh, uh, of the sources uh, in the channel if it's out. And so with this data, it's possible to study both the long-term variability, so 17 years of data, but also the short-term variability, the, like looking in chunks and then trying to derive the power uh, spectrum uh, and look for correlation uh, with black hole mass, accretion rate, and so on. The other thing that is very interesting to do with this great data set of 7 million seconds is to look for transient sources. And this has been done by Neil Brandt and his collaborator, where they were able to track, like, to find like um, uh, sources that had like a transient and excessive uh, um, uh, flux, high flux episodes. And these are a couple of, of examples where the sources were constant most of the uh, time during 17 years uh, of observation, but suddenly at a, uh, um, a high peak uh, of uh, um, X-ray emission. And the variability is so like not very well studied and there's, there's, there's been done some work in the cosmos field, again by Giorgio Lanzuidis, but it's very limited because cosmos uh, has, didn't get so many uh, observations like the Chandra Diffie South uh, had. But variability is very important anyway, because uh, we know, as for example, if you want to use AGN for cosmological studies, uh, like has been done by Risaliti and Lusso, variability um, uh, is like uh, one of the major problems that is affecting the dispersion of the correlation state of the UV luminosity and the X-ray luminosity. So when they remove uh, from their, uh, their studies their correlation, all the sources that uh, are variable, the dispersion uh, gets much smaller. So these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, can be used uh, for cosmological studies. So this is like, I would say my personal incomplete list of what we are, we are missing. And I'm gonna briefly touch on the, um, this uh, subject in the next few slides. And the question is like, what is the best survey strategy uh, to look for these sources or, or for these properties like variability that we are missing? Is it like to go deep or wide? And of course, I'm gonna focus on the X-ray. Uh, let's start starting from the missing IRS shift AGN. Fabio gave already a very exhaustive uh, talk about the subject. And uh, there was a talk by Marcella Blusa in the last, um, last year attorneys that was uh, very interesting about the higher shift uh, AGN. I just wanted to show this figure that we put in after 2020 white paper a few years ago, uh, showing what we thought uh, or what we wanted to be the future for high redshift um, AGN studies. And um, well, we have uh, Irosita that is actually observing the sky and it's gonna observe the entire sky and uh, at the very, uh, uh, it's gonna find and is already finding some high energy sources, but these are very high luminosities, of course. Then soon uh, we're gonna have um, Athena in the next uh, decade, I would say. We're gonna have Athena, which will perform both wide and uh, deep surveys. And uh, with the wide survey, it's gonna find like, uh, uh, 
I would say medium bright, high Rashi sources. And with the faint one, it's going to reach like Rashi six and seven sources at uh, luminosity of 43, 43 and a half, hopefully. And then uh, for the very, very high Rashi and very, very faint one, I guess, uh, as Fabio said, we might need to wait beyond 2040 for links. Uh, maybe there's going to be a probe earlier than that, but uh, we know that only the high spatial resolution and of links is going to be able to perform, uh, it's going to be able to allow us to perform very deep um, uh, surveys uh, where we can find the super high Rashi small black holes in the JWST galaxies at Rashi 10, 11, 12, and it's going to be only then. So I would say that I agree with Fabio that uh, for the missing Arashiv AGN, we probably uh, need to be go deep and wide. So uh, uh, we start by going uh, wide with Eurozid and then Athena and then eventually deep in the far future, hopefully with links. For the very obscured Compton Tick AGN, I'm not gonna go too much into details. I just want to mention that uh, Athena is, what, uh, is, is really what we want and what we need. The um, uh, incredible effective area, area of Athena uh, will allow us to get uh, a lot of counts for these uh, Hayashi sources. And um, I'm just, going, he, just showing here a nice spectrum that has been done uh, by uh, Giorgio Lanzuizzi, again, uh, contributed to a uh, ASTA 2020 white paper that um, we, uh, we put a few years ago. And uh, Athena is going to allow us to collect all the photons uh, and uh, uh, even for the higher ashy sources so that we can perform accurate spectral analysis of these uh, Compton Tick AGN at even very high ashy. And here's an example of a ashy four source with the medium, in, I would say, medium deep integration time. And so for finding a lot of these sources, we'll need wide areas. Uh, but also deeper integration. And so I would say that for Compton T, KGN, and I, Rashi, we would need both deep and wide again. Uh, the other thing that I was mentioning is like the low mass black holes. Low mass black hole has been very hard to detect in optical and radio. And there's a lot of work that has been done by Amy Rines, Vivian Baldassari and Al uh, to find these sources, but it's been really time consuming and uh, not uh, very, uh, often not very successful. And they are, to, they are very hard to detect in the X-ray as well because they are small and uh, they might not be very active. So you need like um, a lot of um, data for these objects. But potentially these low mass black holes are very important because they can be uh, the connection to the very first black hole in the very first universe as the Marmets were called them the leftover uh, black holes. Those black holes that uh, they did emerge uh, they didn't grow via accretion or, or mergers uh, during uh, uh, across the cosmic times, but they are uh, uh, very similar to the first black holes. And so they can tell us uh, 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 more about the formation of the first black holes, heavy or light seeds. And again, there's going to be a, a tourney uh, by Gallerani and Valiante that is going to go in details about uh, this in the next, uh, uh, next week. But uh, in Cosmos, uh, we have tried to look for these low mass black holes and uh, Marmet's quite high uh, and high. Uh, we collect a sample of 52,000 low mass galaxies up to redshift two, some of which are X-ray detected. So they actually host uh, an active black holes. And um, we have studied both those that are detected and also we have uh, performed stacking analysis in the X-ray of those that are not. And we find definitely significant the nuclear emission in low mass galaxies. We, we can attribute to black holes with masses less than 10 to the six solar masses, which are fairly accreting. And this is very important and allow us um, to, um, again, say something about uh, what, the, what is the origin of these supermassive black holes by computing the fraction, the uh, active fraction and compare with the uh, models, and we can say that these are mostly related to heavy seeds, so formation through um, via um, direct collapse of the first black hole. The other way to look at these low mass black holes, so I would say that here you need to uh, go wide, you need large areas, large sample of these uh, low mass galaxies where you go and find these low mass black holes. The other way to look for these low mass black holes is like to mine catalogs and uh, um, 
they would not pay me this month if I was not going to mention the Chanda source catalog. Uh, and uh, of course the XMM uh, uh, source catalog as well are unique uh, 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 repository of like uh, data and treasures. They have like hundreds of thousands of sources that uh, uh, you can mine to look for uh, any type of rare object, in this case, low mass black holes in low mass galaxies. And uh, in fact, these two catalogs have been used for uh, uh, several of these searches. And I'm just showing here two uh, works that have been done, one in the Chanda source catalog and the other one with the XMM source catalog to look for low mass black holes in low mass galaxies. And uh, with these samples, uh, authors were able to look at the active fraction and so to move forward in our knowledge of these uh, low mass uh, uh, black holes at high redshift. And uh, again, so this needs wide area surveys, so catalogs can be um, seen as wide area surveys. The last topic that I want to mention uh, in my list was variability and time domain studies. And this is not important just because I say so, but it's very important because it was one of the top um, priority uh, uh, that was uh, put forward yesterday by the uh, 2020 um, decadal. And so the decadal tell us that uh, in the very near future, we are going to have facilities uh, working hard on time domain astrophysics like LIGO, Rubin, and Roman. And uh, um, we need to um, continue also the other wavelength uh, uh, to study this uh, aspect, uh, not just for AGM, but overall in general. So uh, as, uh, as I say, variability and time domain studies are really important. And again, catalogs are your friends in this type of search. In fact, you can uh, mine the catalogs for variable sources and transients. And of course, the Chanda source catalog is really good for these as we have both long-term long and short-term uh, variabilities um, for all the sources. And we have variability properties for both for fluxes and harness ratio. So we compute variability for both quantities. And we have these for all the sources. And I just uh, did a very quick exercise to look at all the sources that we have in the Chandra source catalog that are above the galactic plane. And so they are likely to be AGN and it's about 220,000. And what I see is that about 10,000 of them has, uh, have more than, uh, are detected in more than 10 observation and 2000 are detected in more than 50 observation spanning 14 years of data. So this is really good for variability studies and give us like a much larger sample than say what was provided just by um, the deep survey uh, in the channel degrees south. And this is an example of one of our uh, light cur curve over here uh, for a source uh, um, in the channel source catalog showing that uh, in multiple observations, the red one where the source was detected, the flux remained more or less constant. And then in a single observation, uh, there was an excess of flux. And this could be very similar to one of those transits that have been found by Young et al. in the Chandler field south. Of course, uh, this is not just with the Chandler source catalog, but if you were to combine the Chandler source catalog and the XMM catalog, you would have like uh, um, lots of coverage and a very long uh, baseline for this type of uh, variability studies. Of course, uh, um, we already have Erosita. Erosita is already covering the sky, uh, observing the whole sky multiple times. And by the end of the mission, or well, not by the end of the mission, by the end of uh, the first four years, it uh, uh, will have covered most of the sky um, eight times. And if we look in the deepest uh, area at the poles, there is gonna be uh, 600 epochs of, of observations. And if we look at the sensitivity of Erosita, this is like plotted here, at, in the deepest area, which is uh, um, uh, over about 100 to 100 square degree, there is gonna be a 600 epoch of observation which is excellent for detection of the uh, transient and for variability studies. And of course, the, the guys have been already working on it. And this is an example from Maliali et al of a super soft source that was discovered in the very first, uh, uh, I guess, in the very first pass uh, of Erosita. Uh, give me another two minutes. I just want to say that, uh, yes, two uh, minutes. yes, I've been already involved in the um, 
uh, time domain surveys, and uh, this is the JWST Deep Time Domain Field, which is a program with the um, JWST uh, to observe um, uh, a small region in the North Ecliptic Pole, which is in the CVZ zone of the JWST, and it will have like an observation of every 90 days. So this is very uh, good for time domain studies. And uh, as soon as this program was approved, uh, lots of uh, other facilities started to observe and form a baseline of observation, multi-wavelength observation for this small field. And of course, we have X-ray data for this field. Um, we collected NUSTAR and Chandra observations for this field. NUSTAR, we have 21 observations in seven epochs, some of which were supposed to be simultaneous with the uh, JWST, but unfortunately, the JWST had, uh, delayed were not in our favor, uh, but uh, we already have very good data and we're uh, weak and very good sampling and we are studying variability in the hard uh, X-ray. Uh, with Chandra, we have 1.8 millions of seconds, 53 epochs of observation uh, spanning five years, 34 epochs have been already taken and some are gonna uh, happen after JWST launch. So we'll have simultaneous JWST and uh, Chandra observation, and I just propose more XMM observation to happen uh, again at the same time with the uh, JWST to uh, characterize uh, spectrally uh, the AGN that we see in the JWST observation. And this, uh, um, this field is already giving us very good data. This is the brightest source in the field, in the NEP field, is a narrow line C1 Arashi 1.44. And this is work done by Shurizao, uh, my postdoc. And we have very good sampling and significant variability of the source. And we'll have JWST data soon and more Chandra and possibly XMM uh, observation. And again, this field already gave us some good uh, transient sources. In the first uh, couple of Chandra observation, we got like a very uh, a transient X-ray source uh, that resulted to be a redshift uh, 0.83 AGN, which uh, boomed in the X-ray in the first few observation and uh, now is completely dim. We also have optical spectra and the source seems to be doing nothing in the optical. So time domain and variability is where we want to go. And again, the decay that yesterday told us that uh, they, might, um, uh, uh, they might want to uh, fund space-based time domain, uh, small and medium scale missions soon. And so I should advertise the Star X mission, which is exactly a, a medium uh, mission, X-ray and UV telescope, um, that is focused for time domain studies. StarX will have a one square degree field of view, so it's gonna do large areas, and we'll get at the same time X-ray and UV data with a two uh, and a half arc second PSF. So great field of view, excellent PSF. And with StarX, uh, we are gonna perform uh, um, um, two surveys, a small area survey of 15 square degree. We are gonna take observation daily for two years, so we are gonna collect uh, at the end, we're going to have a very deep survey uh, at the level of um, Athena surveys with the 2.5 arc second PSF. Though. And also, we are going to perform a, a 300 square degree surveys, a field that we are going to observe weekly. And um, at the end, we're going to have this uh, um, cosmos uh, 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 like in depth survey over 300 square degree. And this is good both for time domain studies, so studying. Uh, transient and variability of AGN, but also in the end, you can see we are going to get very deep fluxes, and so we are going to be able to study those uh, high redshift AGN that we are missing in Compton Peak and obscured AGN as well, uh, with great uh, um, UV simultaneous data with StarX. So in the end, what's my take? What is the best survey strategies? And I must say I agree uh, that we should go deep and wide, uh, provided that these data are going to be taken like with some uh, um, methodic multi-epoch multi uh, uh, monitoring. Uh, so building these um, time domain type of surveys. And that's it. Thank you, Thank you. Francesca. Interesting and stimulating as well. So uh, let's start uh, the discussion. Uh, please book your question or your comment uh, raising uh, uh, your hand. So let's see whether 
there's anything on the list. I'm not seeing anything. So while people is thinking, I oh, know there's, there's a raised hand, sorry. I see it now. Valentina, please go ahead. I have a, a question for Fabio. Um, I'm not an expert absolutely in this topic, but I wanted to understand better how you, you did extrapolate the evolution of the luminosity of the, sorry, of the fraction of the obscured AGN from redshift uh, four to redshift six and what, which uh, hypothesis did you make to make this uh, extrapolation? You, you mean for the obscured AGN fraction? Well, no, no, I, I didn't extrapolate it actually. I just compared the, the fraction a ratio zero with a fraction ratio four. And we, we see this evolution, this positive evolution. And then I, it, it's a very qualitative extrapolation. I say, if this evolution continues, uh, that will be consistent. The, the obscurity and fraction we, we, we would see would be consistent with the results that comes from the comparison between the luminosity functions. What I really extrapolate is the luminosity function for ratio four to ratio six. And that's just using the analytical form of the luminosity function. So we have, uh, we, we fit the, the luminosity function for ratio three is ratio five. Uh, there is a one evolutionary term, basically it's a, a density evolution. The luminosity function goes down by increasing, increasing ratio. If you extrapolate it to ratio six, this continues to go down, but still it stays well, well above the UV luminosity function of this, as you see, a ratio six. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Roberto and then Andrea. Hi, um, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Fabio and Francesca, really ve very nice talks. Um, one comment uh, and that leads to my question is that uh, this is obviously coming from an X-ray perspective. Uh, and I was wondering if you could um, uh, discuss a bit about uh, multi-wavelength uh, uh, synergies uh, uh, for uh, detecting this uh, obscure region. I'm thinking uh, um, perhaps radio or uh, the same kind of op rest frame optical diagnostics that we use for type two object in the local universe, uh, or um, I don't know, some bizarre lines in the rest frame far infrared. If you could uh, explore a little in this direction. Thanks. I can I, can I start? Yeah, okay. So yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to, to answer that, that question. I mean, this is what we miss in those, those kind of objects. I, I would say that in principle, you need all the information uh, available, like multi-wavelength information. So that's kind of what you get in deep service because you, you, you fix a region of the sky, you, you, you cover it with all the observatories you have from radio to x-rays. So you have all the, uh, all the possible information at the deepest level you, 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 you can get according to the facilities you have. For instance, you, you can do um, SD fitting and this kind of stuff. And then you need uh, to go very, very deep in spectroscopy to search for a mission line that can kind of say, okay, this object is probably uh, an EGM because you see some ionization mission lines or not. So, yeah, I mean, mm, you need that ev ev everything you can, basically, yes. So, so I want to disagree with Fabio, and I would say that uh, going deep is not a very good, um, a very good use because um, you are going to get, yes, this very high redshift, very faint X-ray sources, which is going to be impossible to observe by your telescope or the current telescope. So you really need to wait to to get the TMT, the ELTs up there, which is gonna take some time. However, if you do wide area survey, you're gonna still find uh, a lot of those, uh, I mean, I was not say wide, medium, uh, medium deep, medium wide area surveys. You're gonna find like still a lot of those high redshift or obscure sources, but which are more um, accessible to your facilities. And we have a lot of these uh, large area telescopes that are coming along, we have Rubin, which is gonna perform wide area surveys. And uh, it's gonna also do deep observation in some fields. So it's gonna go significantly deeper, providing very good multi-wavelength data, um, which are deep enough uh, for reaching the higher shift and be associated with those medium, medium deep, medium wide uh, surveys. 
Thanks. I'm glad that uh, the question stirred a little controversy between the speakers in the, in the spirit of the tournaments. We agree to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> So but the, can I add another please. point? I want to say that um, I don't know if you guys followed yesterday the decadal, but um, the decadal is like um, uh, thinking that for the future we should have an X ray plus an infrared um, uh, telescope associated. I don't know what they are planning and how they want to build it, maybe it's just in their mind. But uh, having X ray and infrared uh, data together is going to be a very good use because uh, if you have these high energy sources, you want to have an infrared telescope where you, you're going to see the counterpart of these uh, uh, high energy AGN, as you were mentioning. So that would be um, really good. Although I'm not sure what they want to build because having two probes probably doesn't. So, so Francesca, I did understand this point in, in, the, in the document of the Kendall survey. Do they want to do that, uh, like to have them at the same time simultaneously, or, or first the far infrared and X ray or vice versa? I guess that they want to allocate money to study uh, two concepts that could fly together because they realize that um, only putting forward a single mission, like a Louvoir type of mission, it's not enough and you need to have all of them. And this is the reason why they the scope the Louvre to be a smaller telescope and so a cheaper type of thing. Still 11 billion, it's not that cheap, but uh, so they can allocate uh, some more money. Like uh, I think they were mentioning five and three billions to an X-ray type of mission and five to an infrared type of mission to do studies and build those and have them theoretically fly at the same time. Otherwise, we would be left with single. Yeah, but the decision will, will be taken by the next decade or so, is it? right? Who knows? Oh. Possibly. Okay. So, thanks, and Andrea. Uh, okay, thanks to both. Uh, I have a question for Francesca, but I would appreciate the opinion of, of both the, the, the knights. Uh, so even assuming that uh, U.S. found the 20 billion to build the cheap Louvoir first and then have this X-ray and uh, infrared, that would be in the late 40 that I would, well, for me is definitely outside or inside the horizon, but I think for many of us is of uh, little interest. Uh, to be more pra uh, practical, I mean, if, uh, in, in the probe, as far as the X-ray probe is concerned. Uh, if I understood correctly, both X-star and Axis concept, let, let me say, are doing already better than uh, Athena, assuming that Athena can achieve the five arc second. So the question is uh, uh, for the high redshift AGN science, if you have the option to choose, would you go for X-star or for Axis, for an X-star like, or with the, the I mean, with, <coughs> or for an Axis like mission? So I think um, I like a lot uh, this, uh, the Star X concept, having both the X-ray and UV telescope, because that is, it would be a giant, it's a super swift, but let's not call it like this. But um, it's gonna allow us to do a real uh, UV X-ray studies uh, simultaneous uh, at the same time. And this is like uh, what, uh, we really want. We are going to be left with no UV telescope very soon. I mean, do we have a UV telescope even like uh, uh, in space? So that is like, um, I'm really in favor of that. And um, thinking about, you know, I think that both mission would have the same PSF because mirrors are going to be built for the two mission by the same lab. So I guess that uh, if I uh, if I had to decide, I really wanted like a, a UV telescope on board as well. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't really know well the Star X. So yeah, I think that for for for, for instance, for for uh, selecting very faint distant objects, so low luminosity, obscure regions, very very high uh, you need the sensitivity, but also the angular resolution. If it's a key, if a really key point. Uh, and this is why the, the Chandler fields were so uh, successful in, uh, in, in which low luminosity is uh, up, up to kind of high ratio. Uh, so yeah, 
I think the important thing is that a very high angular resolution, then um, it's okay to do a time domain uh, serve, it's perfect, I like it. Uh, but yeah, the important thing is that a good telescope with high angular resolution, yes. Thanks. There's a question by Gianni. Uh, Please, Gianni. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I was muted still. Uh, thank you, Francesca and Fabio, for the very interesting talk. M uh, mine is more a comment uh, uh, than a question. Uh, high worship quasars uh, have been mentioned by both. Uh, um, there isn't a single definition of high worship. Uh, anyway, if I take uh, as a high worship, uh, worship greater than seven, for example, uh, this is uh, an extreme definition. Mm -hmm. uh, I want, I would like to remind uh, what Euclid uh, can do uh, uh, for those quasars. Uh, 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 as, as, assuming uh, 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 realistic uh, and probably also even pessimistic uh, evolution uh, from redshift five uh, to higher redshift. Uh, the estimates uh, that have been uh, put together for Euclid is that at the end of the mission, Euclid can provide of the order of uh, uh, 100 quasars above Rashid 7 and a few of the order of 10 above Rashid 8. Uh, I think that this number will be unsurpassed for quite a long time in the future. Um, and most of these uh, will be uh, below the knee of the luminosity function. So if we want to say they, uh, they are faint AGN in that respect, if we define everything below the knee as faint, so that will be an example of wide 15,000 square degree and deep survey for higher ship quasars. Do you have any comment on this? I can start, yeah, definitely, yes, of course. Uh, there will be a, a, some problems related with the identification of, of the nature of this object. So for sure, uh, what will be very clear uh, will be type one quasars, again, given low luminosity, AGNs, uh, but at some point, you, it's really difficult to say, also, also in the local you know, so at low rash, it's difficult to say if, if a, um, an object is a uh, low luminosity gen or, or, or a galaxy, it would be even harder if the, the, the gen is obscured. So yeah, definitely. Uh, in addition, also Rubin would, 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 would do the same over the, I mean, probably not to the same depth, but uh, over the entire sky, basically. So of, of course, in the future, all these kind of facilities would be uh, extremely good to, uh, to improve uh, our knowledge in this respect. But still, I think uh, an extra mission is what really uh, we need to take on some of these kind of um, problems like obscuration or the, uh, the mixture between AGN and, and, and galaxy mission. Do you really need like an X-ray type of mission that is gonna detect those sources and see if there is an X-ray source in there? Or if uh, it's a just an just a galaxy with no active black hole at high redshift. Well, not necessarily because uh, spectroscopic follow up of the Euclid candidate will determine if those objects are really a gen or not. Of course, also these spectroscopic uh, follow-up uh, will be demanding. They will be tough, but possible with existing instruments. So, Johnny, you, you're including also objects that are obscured, so you see no, just the no, host no. or just unobscured? No, 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 no. In this, in this estimate, only type one is. It's only here. type one. Okay, it's so. only type one. Yeah, the, the easy one. <laughs> for, one, yes. for, the, for this kind of survey. <laughs> yes. no, no, so, uh, I would like also to add that in principle, so uh, when we talk about low luminosity GNs now, 
if we add something like links, uh, what we really say, what we really mention as low luminosity would be much lower luminosities uh, and a redshift of eight or, or nine. It would be much below the mean luminosity function. So um, yeah, not moderate luminosity genes. We, we would uh, detect really, really uh, the, the lowest luminosity. I mean, black holes are the massive of 10 to the six, 10 to the seven, now we actually eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say actually eight, nine, 10. So thanks. And I think there's a question from Giovanni Mastolari. Please, Giovanni, go ahead. Thank you both to the speakers. And I would, uh, I would ask uh, a question about, uh, um, there is a, a sort of accordance between what we can observe uh, with the, for, for this high redshift uh, AGN and what theoretical models predict for their features and the number of, maybe of obscure AGN at high redshift. So the, you, Fabio Vito, you spoken about uh, ninety percent of obscure AGN on the total at redshift six. Uh, is this number, for example, supported also by semi-analytical cosmological model or theoretical model in general? Uh, yes, actually, yes. There are a few uh, works. For instance, there is uh, Nietal uh, twenty twenty. Uh, Roberto, you yeah, the, the chair is actually one of, of the co-authors of that, that paper. They use uh, cosmological simulations and basically um, studied how many, uh, I mean, if, if a black hole is obscured looking at it from different line of sight, basically, and they can, the conclusion is basically that also in numerical simulation, you expect um, a very large fraction, about 90% or so, or even more probably in the simulation of uh, AGNs that are obscured, so you don't see them in this uh, it, I mean, you it, it don't, it don't select them using uh, UV colors. So yes, definitely. Okay, thank you. Yep. So Francesca, so let's see whether there are other questions. Uh, I'm not seeing any. I see a raised hand from Scuola Normale Superiore Hi, Agri Ricerca Innovazione. Simona Gallerani. Simona, please. Hi. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys again for the nice talks. I have a comment and maybe just a question or curiosity for Francesca. So my comment is that I think that for the search of uh, obscure DGN at high redshift, uh, it was a very big loss for the community, the cancellation of SPICA. And uh, in fact, we have uh, in, in the simulation by Fabio Di Marcia that Fabio was also presenting, we were showing that uh, um, Basically, if you have, uh, uh, as also Roberto was uh, asking, multivalent observations uh, from UV to far infrared passing through the mid infrared, in the mid infrared, the obscured IGN would be extremely bright. So, in this sense, speaker, the cancellation of speaker was a big loss. And I wanted to ask to Francesca if she knows anything about uh, the Origin Space Telescope that, in principle, could do like, uh, I mean, kind of science is similar, even maybe better than speak up. Thank you. So I guess that this is what um, they were, I saw a little bit of chatter yesterday about the origins or cosmic origins, um, which uh, it's just like links was not fully endorsed by the, the CADAL, but they endorse a type of uh, um, infrared, far infrared telescope. And everybody was talking about, this is gonna be just like speak up. And uh, or like this is what the speaker was supposed to be, and so it could it could replace that. So I think that what I was saying before is that definitely having both the infrared and the X-ray uh, type of small or I mean uh, uh, the scope version of links and the scope version of um, origins uh, would be excellent for this kind of um, uh, studies that we were talking about, both the high redshift, both the obscured. So hopefully the, the commitment uh, or like hopefully the recommendation that has been proposed by this decade um, is gonna be actually a, commit, a commitment uh, from the agencies to put the money forward for this type of studies. 
That's very good uh, news. Thank you. <laughs> so, thanks, Simona. Thanks, everybody. I think uh, at the moment there are no more raised hands, and it's a quarter past four. So probably we could stop our discussion here. Uh, we thank uh, Francesca and, and Fabio again, and uh, I don't know whether Paolo wants to close uh, and uh, remind all the participants about the next uh, tourney. No, really, I mean, we just, uh, I'm going to send another email with the link for the um, uh, tourneys the next week. So on um, Monday, we're going to um, have uh, let me see, because I remember at 3 p.m. we're going to have Viola Levato and Antonino Marasco discussing about correlations between the tiny black hole and the big galaxy. So it's you on Monday. See you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Fabio, thanks, Francesca. Thanks, Roberto. Bye. 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 Bye.